Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our 37th seminar of the Centre of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation. I'm Dr. John Pierce, postdoctoral researcher here at the Aphasia CRE and a co facilitator of the series with Dr. Sonia Brownset. Uh, before we do anything else, I just want to acknowledge that this event and, and many of our participants are all located on the lands of traditional custodians in Australia. And so today we're speaking to you from Wurundjeri land and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any First Nations people joining us online today. So today we have Professor Sabine Corson joining us in person here at uh, the Aphasia CRA at La Trobe University, which is, um, I guess, something we've done less and less over the past <laughs> few years is in-person presentations, so it's fantastic. And Sabine's going to be presenting on two novel and quite interesting technology supports um, that are being developed Sabine has come here from Mines in Germany for the month of March, and we realised this is a great opportunity to hear about her work. <clears throat> uh, but before I formally introduce Sabine, I'm just going to cover some brief housekeeping. So first of all, if you're not part of our community of practice, we recommend you uh, follow this link and join up, and benefits to subscribing to that include the regular newsletter and updates about our work that the CRE is part of opportunities to contribute to research and networking opportunities. And the CRE is always looking for financial support. So if you wish to donate, please see our website for details. You can also connect with us on social media by Twitter and Facebook. And now we have a blog where you can uh, subscribe to updates. And as always, if you'd like to tweet about uh, what Sabine presents on today, please do so with the hashtag aphasiacre. Uh, today's webinar is being, seminar is being recorded for future viewing and you can find that on our website in the resources tab along with um, a heap of other different resources. And as well as that, uh, the Aphasia CRE also now has a YouTube channel where you can access past seminar recordings. So you can subscribe to that to receive notifications about new videos if you prefer. Um, the address for that is youtube.com slash at Aphasia CRE. So hopefully today's seminar will spark lots of questions and you can write your questions in that Q&A part of Zoom. Uh, please don't enter them into the chat because I won't be looking there. Um, and you can enter those questions anytime they occur to you throughout the presentation and you'll be able to see other people's questions and you can like or upvote uh, those that you think are most interesting. And then at the end, Sabine will answer as many questions as time allows. So please try to keep that to questions only, uh, not too long, and no comments, please. All right, it's my privilege now to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Corsten, Professor of Therapy and Rehabilitation Sciences, Speech Therapy, is employed at the Catholic University of Applied Sciences, Mainz, Germany. She's focused her research on participatory and quality of life oriented interventions for aphasia and in old age. Her research explores how identity changes after having aphasia, and she's led the development of the biographical narrative approach, Narrative, in Germany. She's currently involved in the development of digital solutions and support to support peer biography work and social networking in aphasia and in old age. The app based talk to support biography work in senior citizen facilities to improve quality of life and communication was awarded the Digital Health Award by Novartis. She's presented her work at international conferences and published internationally. She's been a visiting researcher at the Center of Research Excellence in Aphasia and uh, at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. So Sabine, I'll now hand over to you and move out of your way so you can present. <clears throat> Almost hard to do things in real life now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, John. Uh, and of course, I also welcome to my talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation to uh, report about our work here again, and uh, of course, for your kind introduction. Um, you already mentioned the title of uh, the talk today. So I will talk about two approaches a kind of life storytelling approach and uh, peer support interventions, and both 
uh, targeting quality of life improvement. And I think this is already very closely connected to self-management. And I try to, to, to take this bridge today. Um, so before I start, uh, before I report uh, the two projects, just let me have a look back. So um, because I looked it up, I was here in 2019 and had my first talk here in this CIE series. And I really feel very honored that I'm uh, invited again so that I can tell you a bit more about what happened uh, in the last four years. You already mentioned it. I still work in mines and you, you can see it on the map. It's quite close to Frankfurt. and. Um, I brought one picture, uh, at the moment it looks like that in mine, uh, but I'm quite sure when I'm back next week, it will look a bit different again. So um, what uh, do I want to talk about today? And um, here's a bit about my research journey since 2019. Uh, you already mentioned it. I want to talk about the base project, so here, we developed uh, a kind of tablet support supported approach uh, to stimulate biography work in nursing homes. And you might think, why is she presenting this today? It's not the target group people with aphasia, but I think uh, this app might be a good example. And we can also use it in people with aphasia, maybe in peer led support groups, because it's quite barrier free, it's simple to use, and uh, I, will come to, I will come back to this later. Uh, and I will also talk a bit about the PeerPal project. Here we developed an app to uh, stimulate uh, social interaction in people with aphasia, both digitally and face-to-face. -face. And you can see here two other projects. The TEL project is about uh, the development of the therapy platform for people with aphasia, including a, a therapy management system. And the other one, Learn On, is quite different because it's a collaboration here with the La Trobe University, and it's about um, the conceptualizing of an um, interdisciplinary, international subject for students uh, in speech and language pathology and physiotherapy, just to give you an idea. So the two projects I want to talk about today, they are based on the work I presented four years ago. And um, in this one project narrative, you already mentioned it, John, uh, we evaluated the biographic narrative approach uh, professionally led. This was um, given to people with aphasia in one-on-one -on -one sessions and in group settings. And what we found out was that people with aphasia really benefited from this approach. And so we thought, how can we go on? And we meet, make use of it uh, in a similar way in support groups who so we trained people with aphasia to uh, facilitate life storytelling in peer support groups. And uh, what we found was that it was quite successful. So, and I think this is already, but uh, we were on our way to this construct of self-management to uh, support people with aphasia to become really the owner uh, of their treatment and to make their own decisions. So this was the starting point. And of course, I can't do this alone. <laughs> so here you can see uh, all the people I work together with, my research uh, staff in Germany. And of course, I want to thank them and special thanks to Novina and Juliane. Uh, who I collaborate with in Germany. And now a bit about the theoretical background of both projects. So why do we do all this work? And uh, maybe this is not so new now. Uh, so quality of life in people with aphasia is uh, decreased. Um, it's even worse than in uh, people suffering from chronic diseases like, for example, can cancer or Alzheimer. So if you look at the data, uh, there is a high uh, rate of depression, almost 60% show signs of depression 12 months post onset. So uh, people suffer from uh, feelings of loneliness, formal loss and autonomy. They uh, describe a different uh, sense of self, a more deficit oriented self of sense. And uh, according to Barbara Shedden, uh, aphasia can be described as a kind of biographical disruption, which means uh, every day 
life routines, but also uh, future perspectives are disrupted. And this asks for a specific kind of uh, identity renegotiation, and this could take place uh, in social interaction with others. Um, however, because of the decreased narrative competences, so the ability to have this intersubjective exchange, uh, this uh, really necessary self identity work can't take place. And this means uh, this leads to a poor self image closely connected to a decrease in quality of life. And the idea behind our projects is that the biographic narrative approach and also combining this with a kind of peer support intervention gives people the opportunity uh, by using, for example, multimodal stimulation to do this life storytelling to, for example, uh, rediscover their own strengths. So the uh, life story can also be seen like a kind of resource pool. And so this should lead to a more positive sense of self and to an improvement in quality of life. So what do we already know? I mentioned this uh, when I talked about my research journey a bit. So, um, and not just my team, also other research groups like the one uh, of Bronken and colleagues, or of course, Barbara Shen and Katie Strong showed that this biographic narrative treatment could lead to significant and also stable improvement in quality of life. And we all found that the working mechanism is really about this change of the sense of self so that there is a more positive self attribution and people get the feeling of autonomy again and of self efficacy. Um, what we also know is that peer led support groups really work. So uh, people even benefit from this more than from professionally led, professionally led support groups because they are not passive receivers. They are more in an active role in these groups. Uh, the, facilitators, the peer facilitators, as well as the members of the groups. And what we also saw is, of course, by using supervision, that peer leaders could facilitate these kind of life storytelling. So uh, I can summarize identity-oriented approaches work and self-organized groups can really succeed. Um, and I mentioned here just one paper of our research group. So um, this brought up the question, how can we support the sense of competence and autonomy uh, further on? And I think it's really interesting to look at this construct of self-management uh, in this uh, part, because self-management, as I already mentioned, means that people really get an active role in their treatment process so that they are part of the, the decision-making process and that they uh, can really active decide what kind of activities they want to do to achieve a positive uh, well-being. And as self-management is so closely connected, if there is a kind of interdependence uh, between self-efficacy and self-management, this might be a very promising way to go on with our work. However, uh, there is only a few papers about self-management in case of aphasia, so it's poorly investigated, uh, but there is the work of Nickel, and um, she interviewed uh, people with aphasia, significant others, and also um, uh, speech and language pathologists, and uh, one conclusion is that useful elements of self-management are technology-based uh, treatments, uh, group work like community interventions and uh, communication partner, partner training. And so we thought, okay, we already have some of these elements. So let's bring this together with some technology-based uh, solutions. And uh, then we looked at telepractice and quality of life. So is it possible to improve quality of life using technical solutions? And it's not a surprise, yes, it's possible. And we did the scoping review and it's all about the content of the therapy. So when telepractice uh, focuses on communication, participation and quality of life, uh, you can find improvement in quality of life. This brought us to our technical ideas. Um, I already mentioned these two uh, software applications. So one for the, uh, to support peer befriending and the other, one to uh, support 
the biographic narrative work in a bit more focused way. Uh, both apps were developed in a kind of iterative developmental process, which means we included the future users and important stakeholders from the beginning on. And it was a kind of agile process, process alternating between always revision and re a revision of the app and further development. So we based our development on the comments of the future users and their requirements. So let's start with the PeerPair project. It stands for Digital Networking in Aphasia to Improve Quality of Life. And you can see we are still working on that. So we have almost 12 more months to go. And by developing this social media tool, you can use it on a smartphone. We uh, wanted, of course, to improve quality of life, but we also had the idea that it might have a character that it could prevent also a reduced psychological well-being. And I already mentioned it, it's not just about digital exchange, but also about uh, the stimulation of face-to-face -face meetings with matched peers. Uh, just to give you a, a short or brief idea what is peer befriending, so peer befriending means that you can benefit from people who suffer from a similar condition or made a similar experience. So you can support each other emotionally and uh, can, for example, learn from each other. And we know for other uh, or from other patient groups like people with depression um, that it can lead to positive effects. Looking now at the situation in case of aphasia, peer befriending is takes mostly place in uh, peer support groups. Um, and we already know that by doing this meaningful activities or sharing life stories, uh, quality of life improves. So uh, people get the impression of um, agency and participation. However, because of structural limits or mobility limits, it's sometimes difficult for people to take part in these groups. And I think one really promising idea is the uh, superb approach. So here it's about one-to-one -one peer befriending. And Hillary and colleagues brought together or matched uh, people with aphasia in the post-acute stage with people in the chronic stage. And what they found is that they could really achieve a, a lower level of distress. However, both approaches, the group approach as uh, as well as the superb approach are uh, professionally guided. And we were thinking about the self-management idea. And so we thought social networking tools might be a solution. And of course, people with aphasia can use existing ones like uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, and so on. But they are often too complicated. The interface is too complex for people with aphasia. And other solutions are mostly about the exchange via email. So uh, we found one aphasia web by Boer and colleagues. This is a quite simple uh, uh, solution. It, uh, made, uh, it makes an asynchronous exchange possible. And they found that there was really an improvement in interaction among the people with aphasia. Um, however, there was no mediation of these uh, matching of people with aphasia to support really this emotionally uh, exchange and they didn't aim at uh, stimulating face-to-face -face meetings and this is where our project started. Um, as I already mentioned we developed our app in a kind of user-centered approach and it took us I think almost one year and today I can tell you a bit more about the feasibility study. So we included four persons with aphasia here in this feasibility study. Um, and currently we are already working at the evaluation in this pre-test, post-test weighting, con weighting control group design. And we are aiming uh, to include 48 persons. So let's see what I can tell you next time. <laughs> so looking at the feasibility study, um, we offered a training to our users for about three hours. So we uh, taught them how to use the app and uh, talked a bit about the different features. Uh, and then the feasibility study took place over two months. Uh, in the first phase, the so-called support phase, uh, people were visited by our staff and they got feedback. They also got some tasks, for example, like 
at least um, posting two activities per week in this app or sending two messages. And this was followed by a so-called autonomous phase. And here we only provided technical support. Uh, we evaluated this by using semi-structured interviews, questionnaires, and of course we were able to track, uh, for example, the total amount of messages in the app. So this is how the app looks like. As I already mentioned, it has a quite simple interface to make it uh, really uh, easy to use for people with aphasia. And we minimized uh, the amount of swipe gest gestures. Uh, and you can see the important tools were text components to, for example, initiate the conversation, but also to tell people how you like to communicate with them. Um, so there are also reminder functions for activities and explainer videos in our app. And you can see here this finding friends function on the left side and on the right side, you can see the chat with the text component. So looking at the content of the app, apart from a chat function and a telephone function, the core elements about, uh, are about participant matching. So you can search for friends in the app, for example, uh, regarding uh, parameters like age or hobbies or uh, gender. And the other core element uh, is about uh, posting activities. So you can invite uh, people uh, for activities, but if it's desired, you can also post them on a public page. And here you can see examples for these activities, cycling and uh, hiking. And uh, this is one, uh, screen that shows uh, how people could select uh, different activities uh, so supported by using a pictogram. So looking now at our results, we looked at the ease of use. We also looked uh, how people could handle the app. So could they use the different functions? And of course, we wanted to learn a bit more about the satisfaction with the app. I already mentioned the instruments we use to evaluate this. And here you can see, or you uh, have an overview over our participants. You can see they were all male. <laughs> They're quite young for people with aphasia. Uh, they were all in the chronic stage and uh, the severity level of aphasia ranged from mild to severe. And you could see they were all supported by uh, different people by significant others apart from patient three. He lived in a nursing home and was supported by an SLP. All of our participants still use technical devices like a smartphone or a computer um, also after the stroke. However, patient three felt a bit insecure in the use of these devices now after having a stroke. And here you can see some data uh, concerning the feasibility. So all of our participants use the app at least uh, once a week. Um, they send the asked uh, amount of messages apart from patient three. Um, the number of activities was quite low, so they were a bit reluctant to post activities or preferred the chat apart from patient three again. He thought he had problems in writing, so uh, he refused uh, to use the chat. I think he underestimated his skills here, and it was more about confidence. Uh, they all um, liked using the text components. They used the keyboard, and of course, patient three didn't use the keyboard here. Uh, looking at the functions, they all found their way uh, around the menu, so they were able to use uh, different functions in the app. Uh, but you can see again here, patient three uh, said, okay, it's difficult or almost impossible to write messages. And patient four had problems in using emojis. And finally, looking at the acceptability, uh, apart from patient three, uh, the other patients were satisfied with the app. They wanted to use it in the future and they said they would recommend it to other people. We have also some quotes here from our qualitative uh, data. So you can see again, uh, for example, the scores of patient one said, okay, you, you really like these short text components to use. Uh, patient two uh, was quite positive about the app. I surprised myself in positive terms. 
Uh, and patient four, this is the one with this blue uh, quotes, uh, he said, or his father said, he really liked planning activities. And I think you can see again uh, that patient three was really more critical and uh, he was the only one with mild uh, signs of depression. So maybe it's really about this feeling of confidence in using uh, a technical device. So to summarize this, uh, I think uh, we could, we were able to show for this uh, small amount of people that the app is usable. Of course, there were some technical errors left and they had some problems in uploading the app, but they liked the multimodal support and uh, the text components. As I already said, they all found their way around uh, the menu. They um, sent the messages we asked for, but uh, we had to stimulate to stimulate them to really post some activities. Um, and three or four were already satisfied and would recommend the app. So as I said, now we are working on a quite broader evaluation of the app and I think we still have to modify some aspects here. So this was the first project. And now I go on to the second one to the biographic narrative work in nursing homes. And here you can see the title of this project, Biography Work in Senior Facilities with Tablet Support to Improve Quality of Life and Communication. Um, and we have one more month to go in this project, so I can tell you a bit more about the results here. Um, and why did we start all that now? Um, looking at uh, this movement to a long-term residential aged care, it's again like uh, having a stroke, it's a life-changing event, event. So, and you can see people suffer from feelings like loneliness um, because they lose their former connections and networks. And you can see that, for example, the rate of depression is twice as high as an elderly people living at home. So uh, this also means there is a a growth in the risk of getting, uh, for example, dementia or other uh, physical illnesses. And all this leads again to a reduced quality of life. So biography work is not new in nursing homes. It's quite a quality characteristic of modern nursing care. And uh, looking at the literature, you can see that biographical interventions in one-on-one -on -one settings, but also in groups uh, really are helpful to improve mood and quality of life in residents. And in our review, we looked at people with no or just or only mild uh, cognitive um, limits or impairments. So, um, but what you can also see, this is not really systematically used because of a shortage in staff in the nursing homes. And mostly um, biography work in this target group is used uh, with people with dementia to improve or to support their memory. And it's not about the improvement of quality of life. So we wanted to work with people with no to mild cognitive impairments. And uh, maybe you remember this slide or you recognize it. So it's just in another color and there are only two things different from looking at people with aphasia. So here again, we have this kind of biographical disruption. Um, because of this uh, moving to the long-term care. And of course, pe elderly people are able to talk about this change in their life. However, as I already said, there is a decrease in social participation. So this means there is again a limitation in this necessary identity work and uh, biography work here means to make it possible to have this intersubjective exchange. Um, so we had the idea, okay, we can make, or we can come up with a technical solution, um, but it would be necessary to, that it can be carried out by, by late persons because of the chef, uh, staff shortage. And so we found some literature that said uh, it can be done by guided volunteers, for example, in palliative care. Uh, but there was the recommendation to support these volunteers with kind of technical support systems to make it able for them to handle this complex services. And as I already said, there is some digital media stuff, but it's all about working with people with dementia. So 
this is the starting point now of the project based talk and I uh, explained this in the beginning we made again use of this uh, participatory uh, developmental process and the question was and it's quite long can tablet supported biography work improve quality of life of seniors and nursing homes and now in terms of increased social and communicative uh, participation and depression prevention and now you can see the app it uh, runs on an ipad and we decided to work with a kind of virtual journey to different locations. So you can see your examples for a river, a forest or a garden. This is the front page uh, with these different topics. We decided to um, work with these kind of topics and not with topics like family or health because people in the nursing homes told us, maybe we don't want to talk about family. Our partners are already dead. Maybe our children uh, don't visit us. So. Um, we made it more open and people could decide if they, when they talk about a forest, want to talk about formal visits to a forest with their family or maybe talk about plants or trees or something like that. So you can see on the right side an example for the topic garden. And uh, the topics were always linked with pictures and specific features like, for example, audio files or quizzes or music or the sound of the sea, for example. And all this was used to stimulate conversation. So it should be used as a kind of conversation guide for these volunteers we trained. And you can see here one example of a question, who have you watched grow? And uh, you can also can already see this is quite metaphorical. So you can talk about plants, of course, but also about uh, your grandchildren and we varied the depth of the questions. So there are easy starters like, what plants do you like? But there are also questions regarding attitudes to life, for example. And here you can see the other locations. In addition to the nature, you can also go to locations in the city or there are also cultural destinations. And I will show you now an example of our app um, and it's about the main station, maybe it looks a bit different as I heard here. So it's a German main station, it's in Cologne. Uh, and there are some subtitles so that I hope you can follow what is happening here. And you can see the different stimuli uh, we use to support or facilitate the conversation. Ah, it's working. So it started always like that. And then people were asked, what do you associate with this picture? Does it remind you, I don't know, of your own journey? And now you will hear a short audio file if it works. It's in German and you will have English subtitles. Sie hören eine Erzählung. Die Zugfahrt unseres Lebens. Die Reise durch unser Leben beginnen wir vollkommen unvoreingenommen mit unserer Geburt. Wir betreten den Zug, ohne zu wissen, wo unsere Lebensreise hinführt. Wir treffen verschiedene Reisende, die mit uns für kürzere oder längere Abschnitte den Waggon teilen und an unserer Seite sitzen. So, and now people can talk about this story. Um, but of course they don't have to. They can also use these questions, like for example... Okay, I think this gives you a short idea. Um, so it's not necessary to really use all the questions. Uh, the idea is to work on one topic during one session so people can work in one-on-one -on -one sessions, but we also had groups of one volunteer and two residents. And we did this via video conference system because we worked during uh, the pandemic. And here you can see uh, residents only had to use the iPad to see the shared app and also to see the facilitator. The volunteers or facilitators needed also a laptop to share the app and to uh, see the conversation partner. And now I show you just one short video how it works. So you can see here 
the volunteer it's a woman she is also around the age of 80 i think and there is one couple living in a nursing home and they are talking about a question it's uh, what was the happiest moment in your life and uh, you will have some subtitles so that you can follow the discussion Good. Okay. jetzt dürfen sie überlegen ich habe eben spontan gedacht, als ich meine Frau gefunden habe. Das hatte ich auch so bei mir gedacht. Ja, weil das war wirklich so ein Zufall. Ich habe in Frankfurt damals studiert und war in Lahnstein eigentlich zu Hause. Da bin ich aufgewachsen. Und sie kommt ja aus Bayern oder genau aus Franken und hat in Koblenz studiert. Und da haben wir uns kennengelernt. Also bei einer Feier und äh, ja, weil viele Leute immer fragen, wie kommt ihr dann zusammen? Aber das war wirklich ein Zufall, reines Glück, dass wir uns da gefunden haben. Ohne Internet, ohne, ja, äh, also diese technischen Möglichkeiten, die die Jugendlichen oder die jungen Erwachsenen heute, heute haben. haben. Ja. Das gab es ja so in den 70er Jahren, gab es das ja gar nicht. Wir hatten gesagt, Gottes Fügung. Ne? <lacht> ja. 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 ja, und der ein witziger Weiß. Okay, I think this shows that just one question can stimulate a quite long conversation and uh, this was also the idea of using the app. Gut. So let me tell you a bit about the evaluation now. So um, the intervention took place over 12 weeks with uh, one meeting each week lasting for about 60 minutes. And we evaluated this in a pre and post test design with a follow up assessment after three months without intervention. Um, we started with a workshop for the volunteers. So we taught them how to use the video conference system. Uh, the app and also a bit about biography work, so about the timeline that you look at the past, but also talk about the present and maybe the immediate future uh, and uh, the use of re resource oriented questions, for example, the one you heard, what was the happiest moment in your life. Uh, and um, we also had a, a usual care control group, with me which means we evaluated quality of life also and people who just received usual care in Germany, this means they were members of uh, playing groups or they did, uh, they sang uh, songs in a group. This is a uh, kind of usual care. We make use of quantitative tests for self-assessment to evaluate uh, the intervention. And also uh, we conducted some interviews and did some observations. So um, the primary outcome, the dimensions of the primary outcomes were about social relationships or participation, as you can see here. And we used the World Health Organization quality of life test, breath and old, targeting at uh, the target group here, the elderly people. Uh, and geriat the geriatric depression scale was used to measure depression, for example. Secondary outcomes were, for example, self-esteem and satisfaction with life. And we were able to include 14 residents in our intervention group. They received um, the intervention in one-on-one -on -one sessions or in groups uh, uh, of two people and one volunteer. In the control group, we had 10 uh, residents and we worked with 12 volunteers. The ratio uh, women men for the intervention group, I think this is quite typical for people living in nursing homes. Um, the mean age was around 80 in the intervention group and in the control group, the volunteers were a bit younger. We decided to work with volunteers that were already retired because we know from the literature that it's easier for people, for older people to learn from people in a similar age. So. And uh, you can see here uh, the results of the mini mental status test. So there were no signs of dementia in our group. And now you can already see the quantitative results. It looks a bit complicated. Here are all the dimensions of the quality of life test and also the results of the geriatric depression scale. You can see this for each group, the intervention group, the control group, and the volunteers at pre and post test and for the follow up. 
And important here are the uh, squares, the red squares show that there is a significant improvement in participation from pre to post test for the intervention group. And this was stable. Um, looking at the volunteers, there is a similar result, but it was not stable when we uh, take a look at the follow-up results. There was no change for the, inter uh, for the control group. And there was one additional effect, uh, it was not stable. Uh, regarding life satisfaction for the volunteers. So I think we can conclude there is a kind of therapy specific effect here. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of uh, over the qualitative data. So I already said we make use of semi structured interviews, including questions uh, about the experience with the app, of course, but also about the impact on daily life and feelings afterwards. Analysis took place based on qualitative content analysis, and the study revealed three main categories. The first one, app evaluation, uh, refers to statements that evaluated the app in general, but also specific features. And you can see the app was experienced as a kind of, of helpful guide to start the conversation, but also to structure it. Um, Questions and photos were evaluated very positive. Photos were even described as soul openers. Uh, in contrast to that, or contrary to that, uh, audios and quizzes were evaluated a bit ambivalent. So uh, some people thought they are boring, others found them really challenging. Uh, the second category now summarizes statements about the impact on daily life of the residents they experienced at quite meaningful being part of this conversations, uh, but they also said it was the change from everyday life, so it was so joy for them. And they said it uh, stimulated their brains, but it was, was also challenging cognitively because they had to talk for almost an hour about their life and uh, were thinking about their memories. So the last category, effects of telling and hearing life stories, I think this really tells us a bit more about the working mechanism of uh, the intervention. And we have one category, processes directed to the inner world. And it says a bit about what the intervention meant uh, to the people uh, looking at one's life, at one's self-life and one's self-identity. And you can see um, here it's really about the timeline uh, of biography work. So they were talking about the past, about awakening memories, about the future, like doing things again. And I think most important is here when we look at the present or the statements regarding the present. So this really answers the question, who am I? So they were talking about uh, becoming aware again of their strengths of own values. And here you have one quote. Yes, I have once again become very aware that it's also important in old age, I mean, in very old age, to maintain a positive view of the world and that openness, curiosity, unnecessary. So I think this shows that there, that a kind of reflection process started inside the volunteers, but also inside the residents. And the last subcategory is about processes directed to the outer world. So it's more about uh, what triggered it, uh, listening to the story of the other persons. And you can see here statements on three levels, on a cognitive, an effective, and a behavioral level. Um, so people started on the cognitive level, a kind of social comparison. So what can I learn from the other person? On the effective level, you can see the stories of the other person really went under their skin. So it triggers such feelings, such feelings of fury when you hear such really low points in a human life. And the last one is again about yeah, getting some agency, the feeling of agency and the feeling of doing things. So and then she promised me that when Corona is over, she, the volunteer, will come with her guitar and accompany us singing. And uh, indeed, uh, the volunteers visited uh, the residents after the pandemic and uh, started writing postcards. So they really built a relationship and the volunteers also started thinking about their own life in older age. So what should happen and maybe also which changes are needed. So to summarize it, I think uh, we were able to show that this biographical work can be carried out by trained volunteers. We found some effects. Um, 
um, specific to quality of life, uh, but the two groups, volunteers and residents, uh, benefited in different ways. So I think the volunteers made the experience of a meaningful activity, and this also explains why these effects were not stable, because they lost this meaningful activity again. And in case of the residents, they started this reflection process, and I think this even went on after the intervention. Uh, looking at the qualitative data, we can conclude that there's some identity renegotiation processes took place. What do we do now, or what do we want to do now? I think we have to learn more about the doses, so what uh, kind of frequency is necessary and um, from what kind of setting people would benefit most, so individual or group settings. And our main question uh, is about sustainability at the moment. So how can we establish the app in the care of older people? Uh, it's an open source app. So of course we are looking for some collaborators at the moment. And as I already mentioned, um, I think we can really easily transfer the app to other user groups like people with aphasia. And here at the CRE, we already discussed this possibility to use it as a kind of uh, guide for, moder for the moderation of peer-led support groups as one possibility. So I want to end with my topic in the beginning. What does this all mean for self-management? And I think both projects target some sources of self-efficacy. So people in our projects made this mastery experience. So for example, they were responsible to interact or to contact other people. They were responsible for telling their story. They made also this vicarious experience so they could use this kind of model learning and meeting other peers or volunteers. So uh, this very natural processes of social comparison that also lead to a kind of con feeling of control could, could take place. Um, they mentioned the feeling of autonomy again. There was some kind of verbal persuasion. So uh, by giving them social support and the feeling of empathy. And as we saw, there is some feedback like a positive emotional feeling. And I think by uh, targeting these sources, we can also support uh, this uh, possibilities for self-management. And of course, we already make use of some of these elements. Of course, there is a further investigating of the concept necessary, for example, uh, about the patients who would benefit most from these uh, approaches and also how to include digital solutions in, in a really optimal way. Um, and of course, we are thinking about how to support self-efficacy identity renegotiation processes, maybe also with more directive, uh, interventions, for example, uh, problem solving uh, approaches, yeah, things like that, or ideas like that. And by that, I'm coming to the end of my talk. Here you can see the important literature, and thank you for your attention. And I hope we have time for some questions. We do have some time for some questions. So, if people would like to add, you can see there's one there already. If people would like to add them to the QA box. So thank you so much, Sabine. It's, it's really amazing to see such um, meaningful and thoughtful apps because there's so many apps just kind of pushed out into the world, including my researchers, that are just, there's not a lot of consideration or engagement given. So to see these apps that have been developed, you know, with the users and, and really having an impact is such a, a nice thing to see and hear about. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with my own question, which is um, about lockdown you know, mm -hmm. I'm a bit scarred as a Melbourne dweller. About, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how that was in Germany, but I'm wondering if there was reduced interaction for these people that used yeah. um, base talk. Do you think that made them appreciate the experience more because they weren't seeing people or do you think it hindered it because of the lack of face-to-face? -face? Maybe a bit of both. I think they really appreciate it. And uh, we also had statements, for example, like this was a window to the world for me. Mm. So... As here in Melbourne, of course, in Germany, we were not allowed to, to have visitors in the nursing homes. Mm -hmm. So for the people who took part in the intervention, it was really a kind of uh, yeah, opener. So they had the mm -hmm. possibility to talk to other people. On the other hand, 
I don't know, maybe the simulation would be stronger if they were able to, to meet uh, in person. So yeah. it's difficult to decide, but of course you're right. There is a kind of bias because we also have to think about uh, the limitations during the pandemic and then the nursing homes got were opened again. So mm -hmm. uh, I think this also had an influence on our data and on the mood of the uh, residents and also maybe the volunteers. So, mm -hmm. and also looking at the small amount of people in our study, for example, there was no change in the depression data. Uh, I think yeah. I didn't mention it. So, but I think you can't say, so now we know this is a prevention approach because we only had 14 people. And I think really the qualitative data is more important and tells us more yes. about the experience and uh, the work and working mechanism. Yeah. And do you think future work would want to further it online or do you think you would move back to face-to-face -to, -face to compare? Or mm, I think it would be good to compare it, uh, to learn a bit more about the different settings because mm. now we can only talk about uh, the virtual setting. Yeah. But I think it's also a promising step, not just during a pan during the pandemic. I mean, there might be also other situations mm. that it is impossible for, because of mobility uh, limits, things like that. Yeah. And so I think uh, we will use this also in the future. In the future, but it might be good to compare it to face-to-face yeah. -to -face, uh, intervention. I mean, even location. You know, here in Australia, some very small towns, mm. yeah. uh, remote exactly. places. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll start with a question from Edwina Lambon, who says, thank you so much. Fascinating to see your continued work since you were here in 2019. <laughs> um, question was uh, about the process of coming up with the stimulation questions and the narrative stimuli for mm -hmm. um, base talk. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned it a bit, uh, our decision to work with these virtual locations. And in the beginning, I was not convinced, I have to say. Um, and we uh, talked to the residents in the nursing homes. What do you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. What are really important topics? And so we came up with these places and the nature. And of course, there are still people who tell you, I never went to a cinema, so it's not important to me. It's a very concrete yeah, interpretation. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think people can select from the app. It's not necessary to use all uh, the locations, but to answer the question, it was really about asking the future users and yeah. uh, it was a constant process uh, showing it to them and also the questions. For example, we had also questions, what was your favorite movie? And some people said, so I can't remember the favorite movie. Uh, I just want to talk about movies I like. And uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, this was a learning process for, for us, I think, to, yeah. to see what is really the, the important world for people in this age. Yep. Um, second part of Edwina's question, which I think you've answered, but just about mm -hmm. plans to adapt this app for people with aphasia. Yeah. And she said that that would be ideal. Yeah, I, and we want to do that. And uh, we are also working on a digital uh, training module so that it's possible to do a kind of train the trainer thing so yep. that we can train, for example, people uh, with mild aphasia to use it uh, to. Uh, facilitate conversations and peer support groups. Okay. So thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question from Miranda Rose. Thank you, Sabine, for your highly high quality and important work. What kinds of adaptations do you think are necessary to use base talk for people with aphasia? So you just mentioned training. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we're looking forward to working with you on this. Yeah. Thank you, Miranda. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I could expect that question, I think. Yeah, apart from uh, the training, uh, of course, we have to look at the kind of questions we use. So maybe we need mm -hmm. to, to use uh, an easier language to make it possible to use it for people with aphasia. And yeah, this is one thing I'm thinking about. And maybe uh, when we work with peer support groups, it might be also useful to have a kind of communication training for the members of the group, but also mm -hmm. for the leaders so that it uh, gets easier to, to support people with the fear, severe aphasia uh, taking part in the group. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, next question, Jasvinda Sakon. Thank you, Sabine. How many conversations did each volunteer have with each participant? Uh, and were the volunteers the same or did participants have different volunteers over time? Oh, good question. Mm. Um, the volunteers had 
12 appointments uh, with uh, one resident or with two residents if they were working with a tandem. And uh, over this time, the volunteers were the same all the time. So one volunteer worked with one resident uh, mm -hmm. to answer that question. And I think this is quite good because um, it's not just about the content of uh, the conversation. I think it's also about building a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think this also works, uh, this kind of uh, yeah, th therapeutic relationship. So, yeah. yeah. Was the first session... Was that also open-ended as to which location they chose or was there like an introductory get to know you? Um, they, of course, they introduced them to the app, but uh, already during the first meeting, they uh, made the decision to gather where to travel okay. to. Yeah. And perhaps uh, a couple more questions. Lucy Lanyon, terrific work, Sabine. Can you speak to some of the motivations that the volunteers had for engaging in the base talk intervention? Wow, these questions are so good. Thank you. <laughs> um, it was um, not so difficult to find the volunteers to tell you because um, we worked together with uh, kind of volunteer offices in the towns uh, where our universities are, so in Mainz and also in the south of Germany. Mm -hmm. And I think, of course, you have a kind of selection bias because people who wanted to do the work were, for example, people who were interested mm -hmm. in tech, but not everybody was interested in technology. So, for example, the woman we saw, she had no idea from technology. <laughs> um, and I think the other motivation for these people were that they were, for example, in their professional life, kind of teachers. They had contact with mm -hmm. other persons. So it was not so difficult for them to speak in front of others or to, to have a conversation. And mm. so I think they were really looking for a kind of meaningful activity and thought this might be a good opportunity uh, to do this. And they were open to learn a bit more. So, for example, the volunteers who had no experience in using tech, they told us, uh, wow, and now I can also use it to, I don't know, uh, watch a movie uh, in the yep. internet or things like that. Did, I don't know if you covered this. Did the volunteers share their responses and story, or was it just about you know facilitating? Yeah. Um, it was mainly about the story of the residents, yeah. uh, but uh, I think the volunteers also talked a bit about their life. So it was different from a professionally led situation because the volunteers didn't have this professional role, and this might be also an advantage. So when we do it. We keep this distance mm -hmm. and we don't talk about our lives. And I think the volunteers didn't have that yeah. uh, distance. And this might be very useful in building up the relationship and to have a more open conversation. Yeah. All right. I think we better stop there just for time purposes. Oh. Um, let me. Oh, sorry. I can take it. I'll just share about our next seminar. Okay, next CRE seminar 38, we'll be hearing from Associate Professor Stephen Wilson, who will be presenting to us on recovery from aphasia in the first year after stroke uh, with a neuroscience perspective. So this seminar will take place on Wednesday, April 26. Follow us on Twitter and our community of practice and blog to uh, see details of how to register. We'll see you all then. Thanks very much. <laughs>